Welcome to The Pylon Show, live. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to The Pylon Show. I am Dan Stimkowski, better known as Artosis. I am the host and co-creator of this weekly StarCraft talk show. Uh, yesterday, we had the WCS Global Finals finish up with Dark winning. It was a sick day, no doubt. Uh, but today, we're talking about all the other StarCraft stuff that's going on. I have some absolutely awesome guests. So let's just start it out. Uh, my first guest is John Burton, who is the creator of Carbot Animations. Hey, John. Thanks for coming on. It's going good as soon as your mic's on, that's for sure. Is my mic on? No. Uh, <laughs> there we go. All right, so how's your BlizzCon so far? Uh, it's been awesome. This has yeah. been a really fun, great BlizzCon. I've been loving every minute, so yeah, yeah it's been great. Excellent. Uh, I want to start off just kind of learning about how you got started with Carbot Animations. Um, well, I kind of started, I was actually going to school for animation. And I was doing a lot of, uh, first of all, people who don't know who I am, just in case, we make parody cartoons of StarCraft and a lot of other Blizzard games online on YouTube. So They're you scarily accurate, though. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but yeah, I was going to school for animation. And there, you know, school gives you assignments. But I want to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do my own thing. I put a couple cartoons up on YouTube. I kept it simple because of frame-by-frame -frame animation. And uh, before I knew it, the ball was just rolling. In the mm. first month, we got 25,000 subscribers. Wow. And then now we're at a million. So yeah. Wow. Seven years later. Congratulations so. on that. Thanks. You know, something that I have really noticed watching your cartoons is, again, they are scarily accurate. You know, I, how, do you, how do you set that up? Like, why? Are you, are you playing StarCraft and all these other games all the time? How do you know all these frustrating situations that I get into? I see. <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, I've, I've lived them too. So <laughs> yeah. we, uh, we're brothers. Um, but uh, yeah, it uh, definitely comes from experience. It actually, a lot of it comes from just watching StarCraft as well. Mm -hmm. um, for the first, I don't even know how many cartoons, uh, there's just so much scenarios in StarCraft that I felt like I could, I could just sit down and just animate an episode. Mm -hmm. There's just so much out there. Yeah. Um, after a while, though, um, uh, I started taking, like, I would watch, like, uh, WCS or whatever, or GSL, and I'd be like, oh, that's hilarious. I'm going to do that, <laughs> and I'd write that down. And, um, uh, yeah, I think, it, I think it really stems from me and my brothers have always played Blizzard games, and we would always make fun of mechanics or certain things that are frustrating. <laughs> So it oh, it's a it's a it's it comes from complaints. No, it doesn't come. But yeah, it's a, it definitely stems from the experience yeah. of uh, playing the game and how things feel mm -hmm. at times. So, yeah. Excellent. Uh, so, one of the main things we wanted to talk about here today is StarCraft cartooned. Now, in StarCraft II, we have lots of different skins, and I mean they look nice. But this is something else altogether. The entire game, you. You changed. You made it into something completely else, and it plays beautifully. It's amazing. It seems like it was so much work. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, uh, there's. I don't even. I don't even know where to begin with it. Um, so it's a whole. I like to call it a graphic setting. Um, it is actually a graphic setting. You hit yeah. a button and it turns on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you just switch its graphics mm. um, to the Carbot cartoon graphics, and it was, of course, a lot of work. Even for a um, a game that came out in 1998. Uh, it's, there's so many sprites, mm -hmm. frames, there's doodads, there's things that you don't even think about, like the wireframes. And you gotta, those gotta be multiple pictures in one because like the arm gets damaged. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like that, <laughs> icons, there's all these things that you don't even think about. And then when you're recreating the assets, you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> there's so many things in the game that is uh, created. Luckily, we have a simple, fun art style that makes it a lot easier to handle. So. How long did it actually take from you know, the idea starting to roll that you should make this for StarCraft Remastered to it being fully executed? Oh, 
Um, that's a tricky question. I think it, so they, Blizzard came to us like, I can't even remember when, but, um, and they said, hey, do you want to do this? And we said, yes, of course. Actually, we started working on it. We were so excited to work on it that we started working on it before we signed a contract. Don't ever do that. That's a, it's just a, not a good idea because uh, you never know. Things can fall through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're just super excited. Um, luckily, we did sign a contract. But um, uh, yeah, so I think it might have taken from the very first time they approached us to the finish, two years-ish. Um, two years. But um, we didn't officially start working on it, if you know what I mean. Um, Till I, I think it, it might have been a little over a year of actual official work time. So, well, I gotta really personally thank you for this because, I mean, StarCraft. I have it on my TV all the time. I play it all the time, trying to get my kids interested in it. Nothing worked, and then I was playing <laughs> in the Carbot skin, and that day my seven-year-old daughter wanted to play, which is. Say so do it. Yeah. Get and them while uh, they're young. <laughs> I tell you, it, it, as a father, my biggest fear is that she's going to like Candy Crush and not StarCraft. So it really it was a relief. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. That's awesome. Thank you. I have a daughter as well. So um, she's just starting to imitate me. She goes on the computer and says, I'm working. <laughs> um, so at some point, uh, she, she watches the cartoons and she loves them. Yeah. At some point, when she gets used to the mouse and keyboard, maybe she'll start herself. So. Yeah, it can get confusing when I tell my daughter I'm working, but I'm actually playing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, StarCraft cartoon, absolutely awesome. Thanks. But I also want to dive into uh, the series finale of StarCraft, your kind of original cartoon that brought you into this. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, for just in case, if, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, we have a StarCraft series uh, with the these lovable characters. Um, and uh, over, over the years, it's been about seven years, we've, we're on our seventh season. Um, and we are, uh, in, in a sense, ending the series. Because what, what has happened is there's been a story that's been developed between uh, people, our fans have named them, Patches and Crackhead, they're two Marines, uh, the Zergling and Bob the Rage Lot. Um, and all these, uh, the Dirt Fester. Mm -hmm. um, it's mostly based on StarCraft II. Um, and uh, so a story has developed, and uh, all good stories have an ending. And uh, so we're, though we're going to keep doing Star, I want to make this clear, we're going to keep doing StarCraft's cartoons, like one-offs and, mm -hmm. and things like that. We're ending the series finale, quote unquote. We're ending the story uh, with our next episode, which probably will be out in December. I don't want to I don't shoot myself in the foot with something. Yet, but <laughs> because uh, usually our episodes are one, two minutes long, yeah. maybe three, a long one. Uh, because it takes a long time for animation. Uh, it's, de it, it's deceivingly a lot of work. Um, yeah. This one's going to be between 25 and 35 minutes. So it's going to be an actual, yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a pretty big range you're giving yourself there, isn't it? it I, yeah, <laughs> well, we'll see after editing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's going to be dramatically cheesy, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, so, I don't know, we'll see after editing. Well, I've got to ask, when did you start working on that? Uh, we technically started working on it in June or July. Oh, okay. Um, we conceptualized it uh, like three years ago. So. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's good. All right. <laughs> Hopefully you guys like it. So. Oh, no doubt. Cross 30 minutes fingers. of StarCrafts. Can't wait. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that's about all the questions I had for you. But I understand that you have another panel here today that people can check out. Yeah. If you guys would like to check out how we animate in our animation process, um, I'm going to be animating uh, live here today at the uh, Epic stage. I want to get that right. Epic stage near the Dark Moon Fair. Um, and I'll be going through the animation process, uh, how that's done, and uh, just kind of talking about more about us and what we do, and yeah, and then we'll play the animation at the end, so you mm. get to see it created, not yeah, live, I guess. So excellent, and that's at 5 p.m. tonight. Five, yes. Thank All you. All right. For <laughs> yes. Specifying the time. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, John. Yeah, guys, thanks, give Dan. it up for Carbot Animations. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for coming. All right. Uh, next up, we are gonna have. 
Kevin Dong from StarCraft II. He is the lead co-op designer, also known as Monk. Come on out, Monk. Hey, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Glad to be Actually, here. Yeah. Uh, how was your BlizzCon? Did you enjoy the games yesterday? Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of great uh, play from the reigning champion, Dark, right now. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Serral couldn't make it to the finals. But uh, Raynor uh, took him out, and we saw some great matches throughout the day. Yeah. It was uh, definitely an excellent one. Well, uh, you know, I saw during the open ceremony, yeah. they kind of started off with StarCraft. And I understand that we have a new co-op commander coming up. Can you tell us about this? Right. I'm just so wiggly and jiggly to tell I know, you about yeah. this new co-op commander. So our next co-op commander will be, if you haven't heard. One more. One more. All there right. we go. Arturus Minsk, leader of the Dominion. Yeah. Now, I'm just so excited to, have, to finally bring Arturus Minsk to co-op missions. It's been a, a dream of ours to bring him in. Uh, first of all, because he's the very first true villain we've ever had in co-op. You can debate maybe Kerrigan, but she kind of switches sides. It depends on your point of view. Well, that's not the part I would debate. I, I mean, is Minsk truly a villain? I've heard that he did nothing wrong. Oh, well, <laughs> that, that is one perspective. Um, but the other thing about Minx is that uh, we, he's one of the most iconic characters in all of StarCraft, dating all the way back to StarCraft I. Uh, he was very key in some pivotal moments in StarCraft's history when he left uh, Kerrigan on Tarsonis and to become mm. the Queen of Blades. And that's kind of how we have the entire storyline that we have now. Yeah, that's right. I yeah. quite remember that from my childhood. Uh, can you tell us some, uh, something about the way that he plays out? Yeah, sure. So we really want to capture the villainy of Minx. So the way we went about him is he has kind of two types of units. And the first are the average Dominion citizens. Minx can conscript average citizens to become either troopers or laborers. Mm -hmm. Instead of SCVs, Minx uses laborers. And instead of uh, Marines, he uses troopers. These are all very cheap units, cheaper than the uh, equivalents from Terran, mm -hmm. uh, to kind of uh, tell you like, he doesn't really train these guys very well. They're, they're not the best. Um, but what you can do with these guys is upgrade them with very powerful Dominion weaponry, which costs four times as much as the units themselves. Whoa. Yeah. So that sounds awfully expensive to give an SCV a gun. Yeah. Well, you, the cool part about that is you can switch between the modes. It's oh. kind of like the Warcraft 3 mechanic, Call to Arms, in which uh, yeah. you can turn a peasant into a militia. Well, these guys, the laborers, can be, become your, um, your troopers. So it gives a lot of new meaning to the term pulling the boys, I would say. <laughs> Imagine if you could turn all your SCVs into Marines and just stim into, the ba into battle. This is what that would be like. I feel like Terran would have a higher win rate here oh. at BlizzCon. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe if uh, they were using Minx as troopers. Mm. So the other cool part about Minx as troopers is that uh, the weapons that you can equip them with, when the troopers die, they actually drop them on the, on the ground, and then a neighboring trooper can pick them up. Oh. Yeah. So. So you can just send wave after wave, and it's not going to cost yeah. you quite as much. Yeah, in a way, it's almost like the, we have the Zerg Swarm all over again. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the cool part about that is we kind of really want to sell the fantasy of, like, Minx doesn't really care about these people. They actually cost only 40 minerals, but it's the, it's the weapons, the, <laughs> the very expensive weaponry that what, is what matters. Mm -hmm. um, the other class of uh, uh, units that Minx has are the Elite Royal Guard units, which we can see here. Ooh. Yeah. Possibly coming to a skin set near you? Yeah, I wouldn't mind. Uh, what is different about these units? Because they just, well, maybe not the blimp thing, but <laughs> everything else looks like stuff I already know. Yeah, so these are essentially uh, elite versions of regular Terran units. These are the World Guard, uh, these are the units that, uh, or the guard that makes keeps very close to his chest, keeps very close to his uh, August grad. Uh, which is his, uh, his, uh, his home, basically. Yeah. And he only uses them when the, it's, re it's a really dire situation. For example, in the Heart of the Swarm campaign, he used them uh, only near the end where uh, Kerrigan's like, assaulting his yeah, face. Yeah. It's his last just effort. What's really cool about these guys is they, can, uh, they, they also work like uh, heroes in Warcraft 3 in that they can level up and gain experience as uh -huh. enemies die around them. And they just become more strong. Yeah. Like they, they gain, uh, they gain additional uh, damage, they gain additional uh, HP, and upgrades to our abilities. Oh, excellent. Yeah, but, yeah. So I have to ask you, Dan. Yeah. Is there, is there a unit here that speaks to you in particular? 
Well, you know, being a StarCraft I uh, avid player, uh -huh. the Siege tank is my, is my jive. I see. Uh, it has a lot of power, a lot yeah. of range. Some would say it's part of the most cost-efficient unit composition in the game. Some might say that, indeed. <laughs> well, but the problem with the Siege tank, there are a few problems, wouldn't you say? We can see these guys. Yeah, Broodlords would definitely be a problem with siege tanks. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what would you say are the weaknesses of the siege tank? Oh, uh, you know, it gets planted to the ground, and yeah. units in the sky just kill it. Well, we see some Broodlords kind of approaching off screen. Uh, tanks aren't probably aren't going to do very mm -hmm. well, are they? Well, let's see how this plays out. Yeah, it plays out how I remember it. Uh, they're dead. <laughs> OK, so. The tank of Vac is back. Yeah. But not just that. Yep. Finally, siege tanks can shoot up. Yeah. We, unfortunately, we forgot to give Maru this upgrade. <laughs> I feel like I don't even need to see more, and I already know this is the strongest co-op commander. Uh, possibly, possibly. <laughs> uh, yeah, we just wanted to. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the joke of, like, what if the Marauder could lay on its back, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if Marauders could only shoot up. Yeah. There's, a, there's another uh, World Guard unit that I really want to feature, and it kind of is, in, is inspired by uh, a cinematic that we've come to really love. Let's watch this one. So, if you're familiar. Oh, yes, everyone knows this cinematic. The stupidest move anyone ever made, landing a Viking against an Ultralisk. Yep, that's exactly what it looks like in the game. Well, let, let's see a different perspective. Credit to Carbot animations. This is what it feels like in the game. Ah. Uh, uh. <laughs> All right. So, so I joined Blizzard about two years ago, yep. and before that, I was a fan. And when I watched the cinematic, I was like, "Oh, that's like some, such a dumb decision. What, what BS, right?" Yeah. So when I set about to uh, create Minx, I had the idea to kind of like retcon this decision, basically, because mm. in this, this is a dream sequence that Kerrigan has in which he's facing uh, Arcturus Minx. Um, but what if this were a Royal Guard Viking? What if this were a Sky Fury? Mm -hmm. So the, the abilities we gave the Viking really are gears towards fighting Ultralisks. So for example, they, get, they gain plus 25 damage <laughs> versus massive in both air mode and ground mode. And in addition to that, uh, when they land, they actually gain additional attack damage. And if it ever gets to a critical stage, if it takes fatal damage when it's on the ground, it can just lift back up automatically and gains a barrier. So let's see how that plays out uh, in co-op. We have the same scene. <laughs> it looks uh, very similar. Yeah. All right, wreck that siege tank. The stupid Viking comes in. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> only lost a third of its HP. Yeah, that, that seems pretty strong. I feel like we should move you from the co-op team to the uh, balance team. Uh, possibly. Well, the fun part about co-op is we get to introduce, like, imbalanced stuff into the game because, you know, your opponent, Amon, he's not, probably not going to complain very mm -hmm. much. He is an AI after all. Yeah. Uh. Well, absolutely awesome uh, units there for Manx. But I understand that you're doing a little bit more with co-op as well, more than makes. Yeah, we're actually, uh, one of the cool things we have to announce at this BlizzCon is we're actually introducing, I would say, a new mode of co-op, which we call Brutal Plus. Traditionally, Brutal is the highest difficulty you can currently play. Ah, here's some Brutal Plus fans in the crowd. <laughs> um, but with Brutal Plus, we're, we've been hearing feedback uh, from the community that, you know, number one, Brutal is too easy for some of our veterans. And number two, they're asking for more replay replayability. Um. So with Brutal Plus, what we intend to do is you can choose uh, from from Brutal 1 all the way to Brutal 6. And what will happen is, depending on the Brutal difficulty that you select, you will get uh, random mutations that are kind of, uh, that kind of relate to the difficulty you select. So for example, if you select Brutal uh, plus 6, the most difficult level, you can possibly get uh, the most difficult mutators such as Heroes of the Storm, Polarity, and Black Death all on the same mission. So I challenge anyone to complete that. All right. Well. I, I take up your challenge as soon as Manx is released, because when I have flying siege tanks, nothing will stop me. <laughs> uh, and 
I understand there's something that hasn't actually been announced yet that you guys are working on. That's true. This is a, a Pylon show exclusive for the first time ever. Um, so this will not be in the very next patch, but mm -hmm. what's something we are working on, um, this one's for if nice username is in the audience, we're working on certain editor improvements. So what this means is uh, I think StarCraft, the StarCraft engine is very, is known, or the StarCraft editor is known for being very powerful, but it's known also for uh, being, I would say, hard to use. It's really hard to get into it and learn all the intricacies. Uh, a funny joke we have that I just heard yesterday actually is like, if just to duplicate a unit, um, we would go to like some of our tech designers. We go, "Can you duplicate this unit?" And they go, "Sure, give me a day and a half." <laughs> and we're like, "What?" So, one of the new features of the editor improvements is now you have the ability to copy and paste essentially. So something that took uh, sometimes a day and a half would just be as simple as uh, what you can do in Microsoft Word: Control C, Control V. Now, so even someone like me could use the editor now. Yes. Wouldn't you like to make some uh, ladder maps or UMS, UMS apps? I think that they would be the ugliest things you've ever seen, to be honest. I'll leave that to the pros. <laughs> Uh, well, some excellent news. Do you know exactly when this stuff's coming out or a general so, date? Yeah, so Minx and uh, Brutal Plus will be coming out uh, late November, uh, and the editor improvements will be coming out shortly after that. All right. Monk, thank you so much, guys. Give it up for Monk. Yep. And I'm actually going to leave this with you. All right. Thanks so much, man. All right. Up next, a very exciting couple of guests. I'd like to welcome to the stage. We have Oriel Vignals, the Alpha Star team lead from DeepMind, as well as Dario Lunch, TLO. Guys, come on out. How are you doing? Hey, thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. Can I get these? Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, my slides. Um, <laughs> All right, so yeah, thanks for having us here. It's really great to be in the Pylon show. I'm yeah. an admirer. So, um, so let me uh, tell you maybe a little bit about AlphaStar. There's been a lot of uh, news coming up lately, mm -hmm. so I thought it would be great to maybe explain um, what's been happening, really. Yeah. So let's start perhaps with uh, just that actually we've been here at BlizzCon since 2016. Um, it's been great to see the fans and I hope sharing the experience and what happened in the project has been fun for also you all to see. So um, it's been quite a, a, a wild ride for us. But actually, there's been a lot of work before us. So um, actually, there's lots of people that use StarCraft as an AI research. And we just want to recognize their efforts. And also, lots of people that build bots that play the game in interesting ways. So it's Clearly, super f fun to see like this um, kind of have seen this em evolve through the years before we started working on this at DeepMind. So since last BlizzCon, um, we probably you have seen um, a show that we put up actually in January where you were there. Yeah, um, it's where we played against. Um, Dario, who had to play Protoss, <laughs> uh, more on that later, and uh, also Mana. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw some amazing games. I think the total um, result was 10 to 1. So Alpha Star yeah. demonstrated the first Alpha Star was, was quite good. And so what's up, right? What, what did we do since January? What's the new Alpha Star about? And so the first thing, which actually as a, as a player is quite cool, is that we publish a paper, a research paper in, at, on nature, which is one of the best scientific journals out there, actually. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very cool to recognize the game scientifically as well. Yeah. I don't know if StarCraft has be, ever been featured in one of these things, but I don't think so. That's <laughs> pretty cool. And also, I think I was telling Dario the other day that I think it's the maybe the first pro gamer that gets to co-author a paper on nature. So yeah, it's been a um, great honor. <laughs> big applause for, for Dario. That's pretty serious, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Cool. So as I was saying, in January, we had this uh, kind of Protoss versus Protoss only on, um, on Catalyst. Mm -hmm. And since then, we really upped kind of the complexity um, uh, of, the, of Alpha Star, right? So what we've done is um, obviously StarCraft has three races um, or four. And so we created one agent per race um, of StarCraft. And of course, this agent has to play against all races. And also, we, had to, we wanted to expand the, the set of maps that the agent could play, so we also did that. 
And critically as well, we have each agent, each race plays with a single neural network, as we call them, or uh, brain. Yes. So as opposed to January, where it played sort of a selection of, of agents, this one is actually playing single one, right, the, the, when we did the test. So another thing that's super important that we changed was the fact that um, back in January, perhaps the average APMs were reasonable, but the agent was uh, spiking a bit too high. Yeah. And what that creates is a bit interesting, right? The StarCraft has all these rock, paper, scissor cycles. And by enabling high spikes of action or click rates per minute, you get maybe rock to be too strong mm -hmm. so that you don't play other strategies. So what was cool is that as soon as we kind of reduce the spiking abilities of AlphaStar, AlphaStar became also a slightly more strategic which I think um, Dario was commenting to us. Yeah, uh, I actually had the hypothesis that AlphaStar might be smarter for lower APM. And it turned out that was actually the case, which was super fascinating. Before, it was kind of degenerate. It would favor units that would be stronger with higher APM, like Stalkers yeah. and Phoenix, really highly microbial units. As soon as we lowered APM, the agent actually became smarter. And that was just fantastic to see. And also moving to more different maps, I think might also have helped because I can tell you I played 100 games PvP on Catalyst, playing against the same timing builds over and over again, and then playing <laughs> several maps, different matchups, low APM was awesome to see more complete games of StarCraft. Yeah, and I think Dario was also very happy to play Zerk because <laughs> yeah. he played quite a lot of Protoss no in doubt. early days. So I mean that's so. Anyways, what we're seeing here is a bit like the APMs of Alpha Star in blue, and we see that the spikes um, on the higher end. It's barely above 400, and you know when you see the games, you generally see reasonable micro um, at pro level, of course. Another very important thing that we kind of already kind of rebuilt in January was the addition of the camera, which is such an important element of the game. Mm -hmm. um, not, you cannot see all the maps. So what we had in January, especially the first 10 games, was an agent that could see the full, the full map. Of course, it couldn't see. The fog under the fog of war, but it, it definitely could kind of see what was going on on the, its own units, and it could multitask quite well. So we added this um, camera. We perfected this through the last few months, and we wanted to play sort of as humans see the game through a camera view, right? A uh, quick question, TLO, between the January uh, set of Alpha Star agents where it could see the whole screen and it had slightly higher APM and then uh, the more recent one. What was the difference in feeling playing those? Well, it felt a lot more like playing against a human after the changes. Um, it, once in a while when I played against AlphaStar and I came up with a new strategy, I was actually blown away that if I had, somebody wouldn't have told me I'm playing against AlphaStar, I could easily have been a grandmaster, just random ladder match against a pretty high level player. And what's, what's really cool, too, is now that AlphaStar is playing with a camera, is that uh, invisible units were, using, um, were used as intended. Mm -hmm. Because if AlphaStar is seeing the whole map as well at once, it would also be able to identify a cloaked unit. It couldn't see it without an observer, but it would know it's there. Yeah. And with the camera now, um, invisible units would actually be effective against AlphaStar as well. Cool. So before we get into what happened, and maybe we can see some games as well, let me actually tell you something very cool. That's how AlphaStar creates sort of the knowledge on StarCraft, right? So as in January, we start first from what we call imitation learning. But then we have this idea of the AlphaStar League. What the AlphaStar League it's, it does is kind of it creates a battle net of agents. And these agents, we create a special kinds of agents that we call exploiters, whose sole purpose is to kind of defeat the main AlphaStar agent that eventually we want to play. And what we saw is that these exploiters found reasonable strategies that you probably would experience if you were like, just starting to play the game. So here we see in red an exploiter that found a cannon rush. And the main agent is actually not able to defeat it. But later on, once the exploiter exposes itself and says, here is how I win, now Alpha Star starts to understand a little bit better about cannon rushes, and it manages to defend against this particular exploiter. And then this whole process repeats for quite a long time, right? So uh, maybe cannon rushes now are not so, so important, but you get some sort of, these actually are the main agents kind of playing in the kind of usual way. Um, um, and the, the green agent is a more perfected version, which has better mac macro. Um, but then another exploiter comes and finds this DT <laughs> sort of rushing to kill the observer um, <laughs> building, which we saw a bit of DT movements yesterday as well, though not, not PVP. <laughs> so it's very cool to see that the leak creation process is kind of similar to maybe what you've experienced 
as a player when you go online and understand, start to understand what the game is about. It's super similar to what you're going through as a um, human. Actually, some players online on Battle.net are very similar to the exploiters that <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's playing good. against yeah. as well. You know? <laughs> I know some people are cannon yeah. rushing a lot, and they made me a lot better at against holding that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one thing that obviously happened before we get into the videos is that um, we ask um, every player um, if they wanted to play against Alpha Star, and many of you guys um, were super excited about that. So many people opted in. That was great. And what we did is kind of make Alpha Star experience Battle.net as you would as a player um, to essentially climb the ladder. And what we end up with is um, Alpha Star Final Agent, which ranked at Grandmaster level with the three races. Remember, each race is an independent brain, but it's the same agent otherwise. And it was actually quite cool to see how close to each other they became. But it looks that, at least from Alpha Star perspective, Protoss is the best race. Although I was a bit sad to see Classic lose. I was really hoping today <laughs> I could make a joke about, yeah, and we saw it. But well, clearly, Zerg uh, dominated, perhaps, WCS. <laughs> um, but anyways, it was very interesting to, to see it play online. Um, Dario actually joined us when we were actually playing in, in the wild, so to speak. And um, I think he was more nervous than when he plays <laughs> in the tournaments. Like, he really got like, oh, what's happening? Why doesn't Alpha Star do this or that? Um, so maybe with that, we can actually go and see some games, right? So um, I think you, yeah. you should drive this part, as I'm not an expert. Absolutely. And uh, for the beginning of this segment, we actually have a treat for you, because we have two exclusive games that haven't been played on Battle.net that were internal matches that I played against Alpha Star mm -hmm. at your offices. And yeah, that's a world premiere. So All right. I'm excited. Yeah. So You're going to start with next. Alpha Star playing Terran against my Zerg, and that's a TVC on Catalyst. And um, just starting off, this is actually from the perspective of Alpha Star using the camera Reaper scouting. And it came up with that just as humans would that you need to make a Reaper at the beginning of the game, gather information. It's scouting my main base, it's checking if I'm making more Zerglings, and it's you know, also playing a very similar build to humans, you know, getting barracks, getting a factory, getting a starport, switching, and now also checking out if there's a third base <coughs> indicating if there's an all-in happening or if it can just macro up uh, like a, you know, a regular game. Yeah, I got to go through this replay quite a bit, actually. And it's, it was really fascinating, this Reaper Scout, because it checked everything that you would check as a human. Is there a layer? How many drones? How many Zerglings? Where's a third base? It even started out that we didn't show here checking to see if there was like a proxy hatchery or Zerglings on the side or anything like that. Yeah, it's, it's been really cool to see, because at the beginning when I played earlier versions of Alpha Star, which does early pool, destroy the CC, but now it became more and more robust over mm -hmm. time. Um, and then going further from here, this is a little bit of a, a funny thing that happened that maybe Oriol can speak yeah. to. So you <laughs> see Alpha star starting a depot, making a wall, all very good standard stuff, but just watch and see. Um, not yes. quite a human decision. <laughs> Why, yeah, so why would you ever do that? I mean, the, the way Alpha Star works is that every single action you do, it, what, I, what it actually computes is a probability over what is the next action I'm going to do. And there's essentially, we say, 10 to the 26 possible actions. So there's a lot of choices. And it turns out that perhaps this particular choice of canceling didn't have zero probability. And the way Alpha Star plays is it ranks, it says, OK, this is the probability of each action. And then it picks one according to its probability. And somehow, there's so many moves that here probably did something that it's probably not that optimal, right? <laughs> probably um, not. It's all good. Humans have canceled very important buildings in the past yeah. in tournaments, too. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll take it. Coming up next, we have another very standard situation in CVT. We have Hellions out on the map trying to harass, checking for creep. And at the same time, a liberator that is actually shift queued into my main base, trying to target drones. And you're going to see the liberator and the Hellions very beautifully lining up. And that's exactly what we would see from a high level Terran player trying to achieve and uh, trying to decrease the common economy growth of the Zerg player, which is what you got to do. Because if Zerg is just left alone and drones up, you don't have no chance. Yeah, we, we've definitely seen that this weekend. But uh, this one really surprised me because it's such a complex thing to do as well, right? Like you're setting up multi-pronged harassment and it did it so beautifully. Like it was really perfectly timed out when the Liberator came in and the Hellions went in and it ended up getting 20 of your drones. It's, it requires a lot of long-term planning and also a high understanding of that situation. You know, I, I must make a Liberator, I must make Hellions and I actually have to use them in conjunction 
on different parts of the map while also using the camera. Yeah, the you camera know, makes it definitely also quite difficult to discover. Right, because right for now. a human, it's kind of our intuition is quite good at understanding stuff like that. But for an algorithm to yeah. understand that you have mm. to do it like that is really impressive. And after the drone damage, um, very similar to what a human would do as well, you follow up with another timing mm. attack. Don't leaving any breathing room for the Zerg player to drone up again. Making use of the map as well, sieging the tanks behind the rocks while using Marines kind of using the leash range of the tanks and going out further on the map, dealing damage. And, and as soon as I try to dive on it, running back to the tanks and making use of you know, just how those units should work in conjunction. Yeah, this looks so human here, watching this part, right? And there are even some mistakes. So this isn't a superhuman, but it's very human. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, lose a few extra Marines, but that's okay. Here come the reinforcements. Lots of great micro. Like, every time you went in to try to flank this, Alpha Star ran back into the tank range, which, to me, this felt like a very patient push. Yeah, it's fantastic to see how Alpha Star was waiting here to, for more reinforcements again. You know, like before Marines, you can't really do any damage. But now that it has 10 Marines again, it's once again running out of tank range, trying to do more damage on my hatchery, and just slowly whittling away on, on my forces, waiting for another tank. So I, I was blown away when I saw this for the first time. Because mm -hmm. before, Alpha Star was sometimes very passive. And this was the first time I saw basically a professional level timing push. Yeah, yeah and I, sorry, oh, wanted to add something about what you said. I, I think being part of the project, one of the things you say it's probably better than whether we reach Grandmaster, which is it's it's very human like. I mm. mean we really like to see in a way passing the Turing test of are you playing against another, you know, six thousand MMR player or is this Alpha Star? And I think generally uh, we found in uh, the experiments and, and generally looking at play that it, it felt quite human-like, which I think it's for me like, a, as big an achievement as whether it gets to Grandmaster or not. I can, I can attest to that because I was in the room when you did the Battle.net test. And what was interesting is, so I was kind of lurking on some of the streams of the people that were playing, <laughs> hoping that Alpha Star would match with them. And nobody that lost to Alpha Star said anything or had any clue. People that beat Alpha Star sometimes had a, an idea because when Alpha Star loses, yeah. It becomes a little bit more strange than a human would act. Perhaps GG also was not. Um, GG was yeah. sometimes a little late, which we were, you know, calling. But yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, nobody knew that was beaten. Nobody said anything. It was it was great to see. No, that's amazing. And I mean, it really does look human. And also the fact that you know it killed 20 of your drones and then did the push. Those two things are kind of relying on each other. Absolutely, and I can say from my personal experience, it's not just a pre-scripted thing that happens. You know, if Alpha Star uh, didn't destroy a lot of my drones, there's no guarantee it would have followed up with a push. Mm -hmm. It might have played more defensively from there. So it definitely makes judgments like that. Okay, this happened, and now I branch out to a different choice. You know, it's not, it's yeah. not always just the same build order running down like clockwork. Coming up next, we have another exclusive match. Um, Alpha Star playing against Protoss, once again against my Zerg. And there's a lot of fantastic stuff happening in this game as well. So first of all, even that is making a wall in and scouting was something that wasn't a given for a very long time. Um, it was actually a lot yeah. harder to figure that out for us. Like walling actually was quite difficult because mm. you have to build a wall. You have to really utilize like the, your your, your um, you know adapts well to block and so on and so forth. And that. You know, it, it kind of started building walls, but because it wasn't utilizing them very well, the Zerg exploiter would just run in with Zerglings, and it, it, then it decided, OK, walls are not good, and it goes back to build things in its base. So it really like, is fascinating to see how these evolved through the league training, actually. And it was super awesome to see how very similar to human training, um, Agents relied on each other to become better. As long as the Perus agent didn't know how to wall, the Zerg agents was also not very good at playing the game because it would just win oh, yeah. every game by just making mass circling. Yep. So when I played Protoss against the agent, it was very easy to beat it. So you know, it shows agents need to lift each other up to become better players and more complete players. Yeah, and that, that's a cool observation, right? Because Alpha Star plays against itself, so it's mm -hmm. playing against Zerg, Protoss, um, Terran. Um, it cannot play against humans, obviously, right, to train. So to do that, if a race has some vulnerability, then the other race becomes also weaker because mm -hmm. you're not playing Zerg properly, so I'm not going to play Protoss. It's, it's really interesting to see this and, and almost like interesting to see how as so soon as things are strategically fix on one race, the other race becomes also much yeah. stronger. Yeah, it seems like those exploiters that you were talking about before as well, where yeah. it has to learn through all these cheesy kind of moments. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it, it had to learn macro 
by being cheesed, which is, I think, very profound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then again, once again, very similar to humans, the double adapt harass that many of us Zergs have, you know, um, lost games to. In, in this case, I actually caught the adapts quite well because I, I played a lot of games against AlphaStar, but it's trying to target out drones yeah. and. Uh, getting also the scouting information, but even more importantly, now it loses both adapts, and we'll see another adapt returning into the wall because now it knows it's vulnerable, and I could counter uh, with Zerglings. A little bit of a funny moment here, as though the Dark Shrine is being made right under my Overlord, which maybe is a little bit of a blunder that a human wouldn't necessarily maybe. do. No human would ever put that Dark Shrine there. <laughs> Unless it's a mind game, but in, in this case I'm sure, it yeah, you got confused maybe, right? I, um, yeah. <laughs> I have a little bit of experience with what happened here, maybe. I, I noticed a lot of the Zerg agents were scouting the main base with their Overlord, mm -hmm. so this agent might have figured out, okay, other agents are scouting my main, so I make the Dark Shrine in the natural, <laughs> but it didn't quite grasp that I actually had my Overlord right there. So, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's making uh, reasonable choices. You know, it wasn't um, based on nothing. It's mm. just in this case, you know, it didn't quite work out against the human. This was really um, interesting for me to see as well. The combination of Dark Shrine with War Prism, um, perfectly timed with the Dark Shrine finishing up. And here you see something really cool. Uh, Alpha Star is playing the game very much like a human. These Dark Templars are taking out a spore, making a reasonable assumption. Now there is no detection, but I actually had another spore. <laughs> and the DTs don't see more than a human player would see. And I think that's a really good proof of that, that Alpha Star is not cheating or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's just gathering the same information the same way a human would. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, these big fights are really interesting. Yeah, this, this one in particular, it's... <laughs> It, this is really amazing to me because first off, this unit composition you never see. It's like disruptors and phoenixes and charge lots. Uh, but when it comes up here, right, I see, I see in your brain, you're like, oh, I'm going to bring it into my spines and have a good fight. Yeah. It turns around. Yeah, I, I was a little bit upset about that. Cause, <laughs> you know, it, again, in earlier versions, you could trick Alpha Star a little bit more. But what uh, Alpha Star is extremely good at nowadays is to judge if it can take a good engagement or a bad engagement. And in my experience with this event, when Alpha Star kept taking a fight, I knew it was not going to go well for me most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> As, and when it retreats, I knew, OK, that was probably a reasonable yeah, choice. Yeah, so from my naive understanding of the game, any time I see Alpha Star go attack, I feel, OK, this is good. This <laughs> has to be good news. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, now we have a very similar situation. Uh, it's a pretty messy fight with Roaches, Broodlords against the Phoenix and very strong ground army. And Alpha Star is first fighting, but the fight isn't going well and then eventually retreats and does a very cool micro with the War Prism, you know, engaging but disengaging after a while um, when it's once again not efficient and the Broodlords are catching up with the faster army mm -hmm. again. Uh, it, it does look really human the way it's juggling back those Archons there and not letting the Broodlords really connect all that much. Yeah, and I think at that time in the game, the APM was something around 250 uh, for Arthur Star or 300, so mm -hmm. nothing absolutely unreasonable. Very, very similar, maybe even lower than what a human would be doing. And I thought this game was actually going really well for myself. <laughs> I was winning almost every single fight, but then I get caught a little bit off guard by this, as you said, very strange unit composition. Yeah. Nice ground, but Phoenix to support it rather than Tempest or Carriers coming later. And actually, Alpha Star catches me off guard, dives on top of my Broodlords, and now what we said earlier, Alpha Star keeps taking the fight. And I know, okay, this is bad news for me because when Alpha Star keeps going, I know it's bad. <laughs> yeah, you know, in a few of the games actually that you sent me to look at in preparation for this, Alpha Star used these kind of similar compositions where it started off with, uh, for instance, like some Immortals and Charge Lots, and then it went into Disruptor, and then just straight into Phoenixes. And I thought that this unit comp was bad at first, looking at it. And I, I watched too. your games, I watched you lose, and I'm like, is, is TLO playing poorly? And then I really thought about it, and it felt like Alpha Star had such a good understanding of keeping pressure on you that it was very hard for you to hit that critical mass to punish this composition. So I have a bit of an anecdote about that, too, because I used to play um, this agent when it hasn't trained as long, or a similar agent, and I used to be able to beat it a lot with Phoenix, because it didn't make, uh, with Mutas, I mean, because it didn't make a lot of Phoenix, and made this very ground-heavy composition with Disruptors and so on. 
And that was going well for a while. And then a new version came out from you guys. And suddenly, it made the similar composition. But other agents also, in the meantime, found out, oh, Mutas is very good against that. And suddenly, it learned to make Phoenix. And it's maybe not quite as good at scouting um, as a human player. Even though it does scout, it doesn't gather as much information. But it makes this really interesting, just very <laughs> Um, robust unit composition that uh, works well against air units and ground units and then just makes uh, excellent unit, uh, use of the units it has. And when Dario says a new version, I think it means another week of training or so. Y yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear. But, uh, turns out I'm not becoming much better in one week compared to AlphaStar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one week is a few, few, few years for AlphaStar, yeah. so that's maybe a little unfair. <laughs> so, um, Going into the next two games, those are two matches that actually happened in the Battle.net test. Mm -hmm. uh, so those replays are public and for anybody to, to watch. And, um, and now we have AlphaStar playing a Zerg, which we haven't seen so far, against Protoss. And it's a very strange but very interesting game that I think Dan is going to have a lot of thoughts about. <laughs> One of your favorite strategies, oh, then. Absolutely. You have a lot of respect for players who, who open like that, don't you? Look, only when it's classic against an all-Zerg <laughs> tournament, OK? The, but <laughs> this is a human player cannon rushing against uh, Alpha Star now. And here, something extremely incredible happens already. Um, Alpha Star saw the probe enter the base and saw the probe going to the left side of the map. But it didn't see it thrown on a pylon or something like that. But it actually checks for the cannons, um, probably because one of the exploiters yep. might have done something like that in the past. So it can infer from a probe leaving its vision in the main base that there could possibly be a cannon rush and just checks with a drone. Very reasonable mm -hmm. thing, very low cost investment, but it can win new games. Yeah, we have circlings out on the map. There's no base for Protoss. Uh, however, we do have an immortal <laughs> and a lot of shield batteries in the main. And we have something very interesting happen here with AlphaStar, because usually a human would try to invest trying to take out the mm -hmm. robot, trying to take out the cannons. But AlphaStar is actually just taking it extremely slowly. It's just still making drones, expanding to the third base. And maybe there's a little bit of a mistake here from AlphaStar because it's starting spore crawlers. Because mm -hmm. around 4 minutes mm -hmm. to 4.30, there's a lot of Dark Templars, a lot of Oracles. So a human would probably know, OK, there's a robo proxy bot. I actually am safe not making uh, spore crawlers. So this is a little bit of a blunder. But What's so cool about it is that it's not you know, making a really bad choice trying to attack into the shield batteries with too few units or something like that. Instead, it's just trying to out-macro a cheesy player. And I, I yeah. know you have a lot of respect for that. I do. I, I actually almost wonder if we can learn from a game like this from Alpha Star. Because normally, when you get this amount of shield batteries and immortals out of robotics, we see Zergs fight tooth and nail to stay alive, uh, even at the very top of the pro scene. And it's almost 100% loss rate. It's like you just you do not win in this situation once Protoss has that much. And this is a really novel way that Alpha Star tried to deal with it. Yeah, it's I really guess, interesting. Yeah. Sorry, to, like I think one of the cool things is we because we release all the replays. Hopefully, I mean that was literally Wednesday, so mm -hmm. I think people didn't have probably too much time. But if there are any learnings to be had, that would be maybe for us one of the most awesome things because Alpha Star starts learning from humans, and it would be cool to kind of complete the yeah. cycle, right? And now, like maybe from these games, there's some new meta or whatever that emerges. It was a funny experience for me, too. Um, after I played a lot, uh, a lot against agents, I noticed you can trick humans actually in a similar way against um, then agents. Um, sometimes you can just you know, give them a carrot, even a human, and they will actually f go for it rather than scouting or something like that. Yeah. And I won a few games thinking about humans more like uh, agents <laughs> as well. So it actually goes both ways. You know, humans aren't per all that perfect either. <laughs> Yeah, and we just have this bizarre scenario here where you know have your models taking out base after base, but we, Alpha Star just has still an incredible economy, almost double the work account of um, of the Protoss opponent, and immortals actually destroy queens very slowly. So <laughs> Alpha Star just Alpha Star just keeps expanding, keeps making drones, keeps making queens, and actually maybe we can skip a little bit forward here um, to the next scenes where Alpha Star, you know keeps taking damage, but its economy is so much higher that its supply mm. count is actually increasing much faster than uh, the, the Protoss, and eventually overwhelms uh, um, the, um, the Protoss forces a little bit later on. Um, after this uh, Immortal 
harassed for a long time. Finally, the protos made a stronger composition with Colossus and Disruptors. And this is where Alpha Star finally goes for a flank, which is what is required going against an uh, AoE composition like that, and manages to take a winning fight. And it just blew my mind. It was so exciting mm. to see this unfold live. Yeah, the, the gigantic flank there is really interesting. The huge amount of queens to kind of tank those immortal shots and utilize a lot of transfusion. But also, if you look at the mini-map, the expansion around the bottom of the map, I have never seen any human do anything remotely like this against a proxy play from Protoss. Yeah, and you know, what, what is the one base Protoss going to do against the Zerg that just keeps expanding down to the bottom? So I, I'm going <laughs> to give this a shot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it killed two of its bases, right? Yeah. The, the player killed two of Alpha Star's bases, and it just kept going. So I don't know. Maybe there is something there to learn from. Turns out Queen's are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we have the last match, um, Alpha Star. Again, a Zerg playing against Terran. I think we maybe have to skip a little bit through these things because we're running low on time, but uh, let's check it out. This is one of my favorite clips in this entire series. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see a human player harassing with a Reaper and check out what the drones are doing. There's actually a little bit of a mistake with the drone. It freaks out a little bit, but then becomes a spore. Wow. Um, evading the damage from the Reaper, making a gas. And we see this all the time in pro matches. And this is behavior that Alpha Star learned itself that emerged from that. It's not just uh, from imitation learning, because I think people sometimes misunderstand that a little bit. Because trust me, after imitation learning, the, the, the agents start forgetting a lot of stuff and then need to relearn it as well. So this is very... That's very human itself. <laughs> yeah, so th this is really awesome to see that AlphaStar came up with the same solution there as a human player. Here's a Terran player moving out with a little bit of a marine tank push. One tank is struggling a little bit behind. We have Zerglings out on the map, and just a beautiful catch of the single tank, only taking the fight that it can actually win here. Yeah, roaming here trying to find reinforcements. I feel like if I was commentating a match, I would be critical if they weren't doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And here's some beautiful patience once again by AlphaStar as well. Uh, we have a tank on the high ground. AlphaStar is defending, but then tries to go up the ramp at first, notices this is not going so well, and retreats back. You know, the, mm -hmm. the base is not on a threat. Terran is not really gaining any objective here. So why take an unfavorable fight? Mm. Then if you go forward a little bit, um, Alpha Star defense uh, that uh, push beautifully, gets uh, an advantage in the supply count, and once again goes for a really nice multi-prong attack, uh, taking out economy on the third base. Um, but then also, once again, retreating when mm -hmm. the fight is not going so well and pushing on in from the other side, seeing if it can do some damage there. And it's just this beautiful dance that we see a lot of times um, uh, Zerg players do with a Road to Ravager mm -hmm. composition like that, where you really need to try to find the perfect angle. And this fight goes a little bit better. Alpha Star forces the Terran player to lift up its uh, CC, but then goes back because, mm -hmm. you know, that's all the damage you need. Oh, it's, it, it really seems throughout these games, uh, a pattern I'm seeing in Alpha Star is that it's actually willing to be patient. A lot of uh, players you know, that we see of all sorts of different levels will have this composition, decide that it doesn't scale well, and just go. But Alpha Star is kind of backing up and going for that longer game. Yeah. One perhaps technical note on this is that the goal of the agent, the reward that we give it, is to win the game. That's the only reward. Mm -hmm. And actually, we don't give any discount um, which would make it want to win faster. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually wants to win the game, but it doesn't matter if it takes a very long time, which perhaps is a bit not exactly how we would play, where we would get impatient and say, OK, if I don't win in one hour, um, maybe you know, I quit the game, and that's OK. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting to see, because sometimes it does take a long time against weaker players. Yeah. Because it thinks, OK, maybe there must be another base or something like that. So it checks the entire map, like not quite understanding what's going on, because it trains against very strong players, so if it plays against somebody from Diamond League, it might actually take a longer time to win than against the Grandmaster player. I understand that concept <laughs> very, very well. Well, we're starting to run a little bit shorter on time, so I think we have to skip this last yeah, yeah, clip. Absolutely. Yeah, so perhaps... I over this all um, day, though. <laughs> as, as it was said, actually, in the, in the opening ceremony yesterday, and we actually had a full, a full day yesterday of playing um, Alpha Star, so anyone here um, is very welcome to go downstairs to the arcade and challenge Alpha Star. We have two versions, actually, that are more of a fun mix of agents. 
Um, the basic one, which is supposed to be Diamond, and the advanced, which is Master slash Grandmaster. I think yesterday Alpha Star had a good run. So if you feel like adventurous, go and check out and play against Alpha Star. We also have all of us wearing blue shirts around um, as a celebration. So um, if you have questions or comments about the projects, please find one of us. Um, it's been an amazing team effort. Um, as someone yesterday we met and they were saying, oh, like uh, you're, you're Alpha Star. I said, no, no, all of us are Alpha Star, right? So <laughs> it's a bit of a unfair maybe that we play only against one person at a time, but it really has been an amazing team effort. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much uh, for coming on. Guys, give it up for the Deep Mind and uh, TLO here. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out and watching the Pylon show and all my guests that I've had on today. Uh, of course, you know, this, this show, I didn't make it alone. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am the co-creator of the Pylon show. And my, one of my best friends, uh, Jeff Robinson, in control, did pass away. So we want to dedicate this show to him and show a little memorial at the end. Thanks for watching, guys. I have one question to start things off, asking MC. Did you ever think you were going to lose? Bitch, please. <laughs> Thank you, MC. Three words I would use to describe Jeff. Passionate. A competitor. Humble. He was a leader. Brave. Consummate professional. Caring. He was superhuman. Funny. Funny. Jeff was very funny. He was more than funny. Jeff was... Hilarious. He was a hilarious dude. Jeff is the funniest person we've ever met. He was the wittiest man you will ever see on a broadcast. It is time for our series now. We're going to be going to our best of three. Guys, I see someone's very excited for this series. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> there are so few people in this world that can make me just cry laughing. And Jeff is definitely one of those. The guy knew how to make people laugh and he knew he knew how to do it. And it would make you laugh so hard that you would lose control of bodily functions. You know what, Kevin? Tell me. Do you want to out-hype the French guy? <laughs> no, 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 no. Can I do it? Yes, go for it. Ready? Yes. From Ronald Reagan's <laughs> America representing freedom, burgers, French fries, and all that is good in this world, it is the <laughs> That's how you do it, France. Every single time Jeff would say the most inappropriate, yet very hilarious things. Is Zest the kryptonite to Cyril? No. No, I think he's more of like a kind of a warmish stick of butter, I believe. <laughs> a very good looking one, though. The kind you want to slather on your body, all kinds of stuff. I shouldn't be OK with the things that he's saying, but I couldn't help it. I would laugh every time. DJ Weeds or Scoots, Odie, you old people, you might, you might, you might shit the bed. You might be uglier. Your balls are sagging a lot worse. Jeff would just be so inappropriate on broadcasts constantly. What you've done just by being the See redwood now, trees of our scene, absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> he always tried to go up to the line. He didn't know exactly where the line was, but he was always trying to figure it out. And if you look closely, I, Showtime is not actually Korean. That's, that's <laughs> also true. Pay attention, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I started looking through my Twitter feed so I could get through this absolutely boring ordeal of a day when I heard... But of course, we had the audio on so it's booming around this whole arena. I was instantly snorting in laughter and he loved the ability to bring that sort of joy to people. Zest voted most likely to earn the most amount of money should he run a car wash. <laughs> or five years running here so far. When I was asking him, you know, how do you make so many good jokes? He just said, you just need to not be afraid of looking like an idiot. Artosa of the opinion that SOS would do really well here and he would be he's gonna win the tournament, all this yeah. all this stuff. Just put it away, okay? <laughs> Cyril took that and made him look like a clown. <laughs> when I first became friends with Jeff, I think the thing that I was most blown away by was his humility and his honesty, his emotional honesty. Jeff is always himself, almost to a fault, but he was always very much uh, an individual. To me, what made Jeff so special was his fire and his passion. He was courageous and unflappable and lion-hearted. I knew he would be a good caster. I thought, oh, this guy's a natural. He was so calm and rational, yet in certain subjects, passionate. And he really was a big brother for a lot of people in the scene, myself included. He's someone who always believed in me. He's always looked out for me and the well-being of all of his friends. He talked about a lot of 
things that I think people shy away from talking on. He would be the guy to not skirt around the issue. He would always try and tackle it head on, which I think is really respectful. I was a relatively silent CEO and I didn't speak publicly very much. And oftentimes we would rely on Jeff to kind of be our messenger to the world. In that sense, he was my voice. I remember a few days before he died, I, I resubbed and he said, thank you for the resub, man. And I, I just truly feel honored to call you a friend. And same back to you, Jeff. He had such a huge impact on so many different people that I think he's not gone for any of us. And there's some comfort in that. Jeff, wherever you are, thank you so much for everything you've done for me. There's just such an incredible set of memories there. And I'm so honored to have been a part of such an awesome person's life. There's not a day goes by that we won't think about you. I think his humor will always, always be with us. Rest in peace, Jeff. I'm going to miss you, buddy. I'm going to miss him so much. Love Jeff forever and miss him always. I'm going to miss him, man. He was one of a kind. I'm truly going to miss him. Goddamn, I will miss him. And Taro in control. Give me a hug. Thank you.